Now that we have the gametes, let's take a look at what happens when they uh, fertilize and development begins. So looking at this slide, we see there's the ovary, and remember that what gets ovulated from that ovary is a secondary oocyte. Now, when the secondary oocyte is uh, ovulated, we can see from this slide that it actually gets released from the ovary into the peritoneal cavity, into the peritoneal cavity, and it, for a brief moment, passes through the peritoneal cavity before entering the uterine tube. And it gets into the uterine tube basically by having the uterine tube suck it in. The uh, epithelial lining of the uterine tube has ciliated cells, and those cilia, by way of their beating, create a current, and it's that current that pulls the secondary oocyte into the uterine tube. And it's within the uterine tube in this distal widened portion of the uterine tube that's called the ampulla of the uterine tube. That's where fertilization typically occurs. So we see sperm represented on this slide, and those sperm got there, having been deposited in the vagina, gone through the cervical canal, passed through the uterine cavity, swam up the uterine tube, and they arrive at this point where they may encounter a secondary oocyte, and if they, they do, fertilization can occur at that point. So because that secondary oocyte is being released into the peritoneal cavity, and then gets into the uterine tube, that presents the possibility of it remaining in the peritoneal cavity and not entering the uterine tube, in which case the sperm, which are swimming up the uterine tube, can continue on swimming, exit the tube, end up in the peritoneal cavity, and fertilize that secondary oocyte in the peritoneal cavity. And if that happens, development will proceed in the peritoneal cavity. We'll see in a few moments that when development reaches six days, implantation will occur. And with normal development, at six days, the embryo has entered the uterine cavity, and therefore implantation occurs in the uterine cavity. But in this situation, where development is occurring in the peritoneal cavity, on day six, implantation will occur on a peritoneal surface in the peritoneal cavity which means that as the placenta develops and then subsequently begins to separate toward the end of development, the bleeding that's associated with placental separation will not be able to be abated by the contraction of the smooth muscle that we would expect in the wall of the uterus, and therefore that, that woman is at risk of exsanguination with that ectopic abdominal pregnancy. And that's why those pregnancies need to be terminated in order to avoid that risk to the mother's life. But of course, normally that doesn't happen. Normally the secondary oocyte does get into the uterine tube. Fertilization occurs there. At the time of fertilization, that's a secondary oocyte that's being fertilized. The second meiotic division is completed after fertilization. The second polar body is given off, and we now have an ovum with a sperm in it. The nucleus of that sperm and the nucleus of the ovum will fuse, and as a result of that, we now have a zygote, and we have thereby restored the 46-chromosome diploid status. From that point forward, we're going to have cell divisions, but now we will have mitotic cell divisions. And this zygote will divide, and as a result, we'll have two cells, and then those two cells will divide, and as a result, we'll have four cells, and so forth. So as these um, mitotic divisions are proceeding, and we're going from a two-cell to a four-cell and so forth stage, we can see that this embryo is migrating down along the uterine tube. And this, again, is a passive process being driven by the beating of the cilia of the epithelium of the uterine tube. Now, these mitotic divisions that this zygote begins to undergo are a little bit different from the standard mitotic division in that rather than what we typically see in mitosis in somatic cells in which there is cell growth in between cell divisions so that we have a cell divides into two cells, each is about half the size of the original cell, and then the cells typically would grow to a certain size before they divide, 
In the case of the cell divisions that we have here, there is no cell growth in between cell divisions. So we go from a single cell to two cells. Each cell is half the size of the original cell. They don't grow. When they divide, we now have four cells. Each cell is one quarter of the size of the original cell. When we have eight cells, each cell is one eighth of the size of the original cell, and so forth. Which means that the total volume of these two and four and eight and 16 embryos is the same as the volume of the original zygote. There is no growth in size. We just have more cells with each cell being smaller. That kind of mitotic cell division is called cleavage division. Cleavage, as in meaning cut, we're taking the cytoplasm and we're cleaving it, cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces. So this process continues, and when we get to somewhere around 32 or 64 cells, we stop counting the number of cells and we simply call that, that uh, developing embryo a morula. So a morula which is at about four days of development. We're still in the uterine tube. It's a multicellular organism, uh, but it's the same size as the original zygote. As we go from day four to day five, cell divisions are continuing. We're continuing to migrate along the tube. We're still in the uterine tube, but now we see something is changing, and that is that the cells start to rearrange themselves so that instead of having a solid ball of cells, which is what describes the morula, because of the rearrangement of the cells, the accumulation of extracellular fluid, we now have a hollow ball covered with an outer surface of cells, and inside we have a fluid-filled cavity with a group of cells pushed way over to one side. Once we've achieved that structure, we now call this a blastocyst and we're at about five days of development. Now in this blastocyst, we can now define two groups of cells. We have the outer cells that are lining the surface of the blastocyst, and that can be called the outer cell mass. And we have this group of cells pushed over to one side inside of the blastocyst, and that can be called the inner cell mass. Another name for the inner cell mass is embryoblast embryoblast. A term that ends with the suffix blast refers to a cell that gives rise to something else, such as myoblast or osteoblast or fibroblast. So this is an embryoblast, so it means that these cells give rise to the embryo. The outer cell mass can also be called the trophoblast, and troph refers to nutrition. So the trophoblast are cells that give rise to the structure that provides nutrition for the embryo, and that, of course, is going to be the placenta. So we have the embryoblast that will go form the embryo, we have the trophoblast that will go form the placenta and some other extra embryonic structures. When we get to day six, we've now entered the uterus. We are still in the blastocyst stage, and as you recall, on day six is when implantation will occur. We see that at the beginning of implantation, we get an elaboration of the trophoblast. So let's take a look at this enlargement over here, and we see this tremendous elaboration of trophoblast, and that's what's going to start eroding into the a wall of the uterus. Now, the trophoblast can be subdivided into two kinds of cells. One is called cytotrophoblast, and the other is called syncytiotrophoblast. Cytotrophoblast refers, cyto means cell, so the cytotrophoblast is made of individual cells. Syncytiotrophoblast means a multinucleated cell that has arisen from the fusion of individual cells, and that is what the syncytiotrophoblast is. So what happens is the following. Cytotrophoblastic cells are very active mitotically. So what they are doing is dividing very actively producing more and more of themselves, more and more cytotrophoblastic cells. This elaboration of trophoblast is in fact an elaboration of syncytiotrophoblast. We're developing more and more syncytiotrophoblast. But recall, those cells are not dividing. So the way we are getting more and more syncytiotrophoblast is by having more and more cytotrophoblastic cells being produced by mitosis, 
and then fusing together to produce the increase in volume of syncytia trophoblast. And it's those syncytia trophoblastic cells which begin eroding into the wall of the uterus. The other important function of syncytia trophoblastic cells is that they secrete a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin. And it's the chorionic gonadotropin that is basically the signal back to the mother to indicate that a pregnancy has occurred and is in, in telling the mother's ovary to retain the corpus luteum in order to continue producing progesterone in order to maintain the endometrial lining. So the chorionic gonadotropin being produced by the syncytia trophoblast is basically the marker to indicate pregnancy and therefore it is the uh, hormone that is used for pregnancy testing. So let's now proceed to take a look at what happens after the end of the first week. We've concluded the first week. We've gone from fertilization through cleavage division to the blastocyst, entering the uterus, and then implantation has begun. And now we'll take a look at what happens starting in week two. <laughs> 